Browns and going up against the Broncos for a trip. Fall at all. George Hallis, who was the head coach of the Bears at the time, was visiting the track, and a jockey came up to him and said, Hey, coach, there's this great little running back down here at Florida A&M. You ought to give him a look. Well, Hallis scouted him, signed him, and Willie the Wisp went on to become one of the most exciting and elusive ball carriers of all time. In 1957, George Hallis took a tip from a jockey at Hialeah Racetrack in Miami and placed a bet not on a horse, but on a player named Willie Gallimore. Gallimore, number 28, came to the Bears as a late-round draft choice from tiny Florida A&M and proved to be one of the last great steals before scouting became sophisticated. Elusive and swift, Willie was the Ferrari of running backs, possessing a passing gear other players only dream about. A rival defensive lineman once said, he was not hard to bring down once you got your hands on him, but getting your hands on Willie was unbelievably difficult. Willie was nicknamed Willie the Wisp. And in reality, that was the way he ran. All of a sudden, you'd see him break out into the open, and uh, you don't know where he came from. Willie was unbelievably quick going downfield. He, he wasn't uh, sideways or this way. He just zoomed down the field and seemed to be so fast, nobody could catch him. You ever try go hunting and a rabbit's in an open field, and you try to shoot a rabbit, or you ever try tackling a guy like that? He had speed like you. He, one motion, the same speed, be able to cut. The only difference between him and McElhenney, Willie was faster. To me, it seemed like he did the 109-2 going like this. Fantastic. Willow the West, Willie Gallimore, puts the Bears on their way to another score. Willie Gallimore reverses his field. Bobbles the ball, gets it back. Shakes off tackler after tackler on a spectacular touchdown gallop. Willie Gallimore could turn the corner faster than most fellas could run forward. I've seen him do that. Gallimore never gained a thousand yards in a season, but statistics were not the measure of this man. He painted pictures in the open field. Each run was a Rembrandt, and as a collection, they became a gallery that hung in the memory. It seemed like everybody forgot it. And he's made some runs that I've never seen a back do yet. I have never seen anyone, and I don't believe you have in any of your film, seen anyone catch him from behind or from an angle. He was only nine, six feet, but he seemed like he'd run as fast as he had to. Gallimore was as gifted a pass catcher as he was a runner. And in today's game, he probably would have been turned into a wide receiver. He could get downfield so fast on the defensive halfback, the safety, the free safety, that the free safety was not free anymore. This was the greatness of two great halfbacks in professional football, have to affect. We were playing a game uh, in 1963, I guess it was, and. Uh, the game was very close, and, and I hit Willie with a pass about in the middle of the field, man, and he just caught the ball and zoomed through everybody. I mean, it was just like, it was unbelievable. I mean, they, he was so quick. He had two knee operations the year before the 63 season. I think he broke something like six tackles. You know, just having a knee operation is bad enough, but he had two of them in one year. I mean, he was an amazing runner. I always thought he was one of the best runners, and I never could understand why. He did get more recognition on her. Willie Gallimore. Willie the Wisp. Stay warm with a jacket from Academy. All these men's and ladies' ski fashion jackets are under $20. Academy, where the difference is the price. In his arm was a magic charm that controlled the beam and its flight. Broadway Joe traveled far and wide and threw the bean so well that everyone gathered round him to tell him he was swell and scores of lovely maidens attended to his wants and a guard of honor followed him 
to all his usual haunts. Then from out of the ground, there came a sound that shook the entire show. It came from the tread of some man who said, this Joe is simply a bore. From their fearsome faces, smoke did spew, while their heads were as hard as an old horseshoe. They were rough and tough and worked all day in the sun. They were cranky and cruel and spoiled other people's fun. But Joe's days were filled with smiles and zest, and he turned to these villains and said with a jest, if I happen to meet you guys someday, uh, it'll be best for you to um, get out of my way. What's that, growled those men who were terribly gruff. How can you say such ridiculous stuff? We'll meet you in battle and steal your bean, then use it ourselves to be nasty and mean. And so it came to pass, in a big round castle way down in the south, that these merciless men came to take the bean and shut Joey's mouth. The castle was filled with faces familiar and faces stranger, but all of them knew that Joe was in danger. So they gathered together, put their hands on their breast, and sincerely wished him their very best. But Broadway Joe needed luck of more than one kind because suddenly trouble came from in front and then from behind. They gave him such a knock on the crown that he forgot his bean and left it on the ground. The meanies in blue grabbed the thing and turned it over to their old wizard king. Now everyone rose and stood in alarm to see if the ancient wizard still had magic in his arm. Now in his prime, many ages ago, he could have thrown that bean and hit a dime, but by now, his magic arm had spent its force, and when he threw the bean, it just fluttered off course. The wizard's men looked solemn and tragic, and sadly they spoke, this bean's not magic. It's a fraud, a joke. Give it back to the kid. If it obeys his command, we'll admit defeat and crown him king of the land. But the bean was magic, and everyone knew it, and watched in amazement whenever Joe threw it. He hopped and popped and swung with a swish, and the bean obeyed his every wish. As darkness fell on this incredible day, the meanies in blue just faded away. And everyone cheered for Broadway Joe, for he had put on such a spectacular show. His beam was turned to silver, as bright as the eye could see. And Joe returned a hero to his kingdom by the sea. the end. Finding the right nickname. Now, that's the real challenge. Minnesota had the Purple People Eaters. Um, the Los Angeles Rams had the Fearsome Foursome. And Pittsburgh had its Steel Curtain. In 1958, the Baltimore Colts front four didn't have a nickname. But as you'll see, they might have been the most colorful of all. In the late 1950s, the Baltimore Colts won back-to-back -back world championships. While the glamour of winning went to the big-name stars of the offense, 
The true personality of the Colts was shaped by the defense, and in particular, by four extraordinary men who played in the defensive line. At right tackle was six foot, six inch, 290 pound, Eugene Lipscomb, the big daddy of the Baltimore Colts. In the 1950s, the main job of the defensive tackle was to jam up the middle. But Big Daddy revolutionized his position when he invented what is now called pursuit. Whenever the play was directed away from him, which was often, Big Daddy pulled out of the line in pursuit of the ball carrier and made more tackles than any lineman on the team. Big Daddy was big. He was the first big black man in, in the uh, National Football League. He came here in 56 with me. But his greatest asset was the fact that uh, he could read the defense and then pursue the ball carrier and usually get to him before the ball carrier turned the corner. Gene's forte was his great lateral movement. When asked to explain his revolutionary technique, Big Daddy said simply, I take the shortest route to the ball carrier and arrive in ill humor. And he would try to intimidate you. He would try to pull the nose and things, you know, and squeeze your nose. Uh, you know, not in a dirty vein, kind of like a, uh, you know, like he was playing with you, like a, like a cat would play with a mouse. Reach under your, your face mask and, you know, squeeze your nose and say, mm, I'm going to get you next time. It would really make you mad as hell. While Big Daddy was cast as the team bully, number 70, Art Donovan, played the team buffoon. Maybe he looked like a big marshmallow or a Santa Claus in a football uniform for the player across the line of scrimmage, but uh, uh, a lot of them playing Arthur Donovan got religion. He was uh, especially adept at splitting the double team. He could take double team blocking and separate it like you would ten pins because of this immense strength that he had in his shoulders. Donovan was a four-time all-pro defensive tackle, and he was destined to be the first Baltimore Colt to enter the Hall of Fame. Belying the fact that he, that he was stout and portly, and didn't look like he, he had much speed, had all the quickness that you would want for four or five yards. Put, uh, exerted tremendous pressure on the quarterback, uh, handled the running plays uh, straight at him with the same kind of adeptness. Uh, just a total football player, all you would want in the defensive lineman. At right end was Don Joyce, a ferocious pass rusher and a huge man with a huge appetite that was well publicized and well documented. Joyce was about six foot three, about 270 pounds. Uh, and they talk about, you know, uh, insanity is a very, very thin line. Well, I think Joyce, some of the time, watch him in the movies, he was on the left side of the line. So I said, well, I think Joyce can eat more chicken than anybody else on the team. And the guy said, no, he can't. For $100, Marchetti can. So they said, all right. So only had two more guys bet. So we had $300 bet, and we had this chicken eating contest up in Western Maryland College. So the, the eight of us, the six guys bet, and the two guys eating, the participants, we get in there, and here comes the waiters out with a typical Southern Maryland Sunday afternoon meal. Chicken, mashed potatoes, and peas, and all the trimmings. So anyhow, Gino, he just starts eating the chicken. Well, Joyce, he's eating the chicken, the mashed potatoes, and the peas. We said, for Christ's sake, don't worry about the mashed potatoes and peas. Just eat the chicken. So anyhow, Gino eats 23 pieces of chicken. He stops. 23, 25. Well, Joyce is 24. He said, two more, champ, and we win. We called him champ because in the offseason he was a wrestler. He and Big Daddy had a tag team match. You know, they were tag teams. So anyhow, he says, Al, I'm still hungry. And he eats 36 pieces of chicken. So finally he says, whoa, he says, I can't eat any more. He says, he says, I got to wash this down. And in front of him we had a big pitcher of iced tea. So there you are, champ. Eat it all. Hey, drink it all. We don't care if he blows up now because we won the bet. With that, he reached into his pocket and pulled out four pieces of saccharin and dropped it in the iced tea. He was watching his calories. Left end Gino Marchetti, number 89, liked quarterbacks more than chicken. And on Sunday afternoons, he dined in style. Gino the Giant was a defensive end in the classic sense. He didn't just play the position, he was the position.
You couldn't run at him, by him, or around him. And if you ran away from him, he had the speed to track you down. Marchetti, in his own words, played mad all the time. And his temper was a permanent part of his weaponry. Marchetti was the backbone of that defense. You know, to watch him pace that locker room before a game, I mean, he was like a caged lion. Yeah, I didn't really stop to think about that until right at this moment you talk about that, but I've been around a lot of locker rooms since then. I don't see, you know, that all the time. I mean, that intensity is not something you just find every day. It's one of the reasons why he was a great one. Gino Marchetti was the backbone of a defense that had many heroes and more than its share of clowns, who together shared many moments of low comedy and high drama. We enjoyed the game. Uh, who ever thought that of all the kids that played football down through the years in all the grammar schools and high schools and colleges, that you would be picked or be lucky enough to play professional football? And we used to we used to look back on that and say, we're lucky. We're lucky we're here. Uh, this is a, you know, this is something great happening to us that it doesn't happen to too many guys. Period. That's the way we all looked at it. 